the applause. Um, <laughs> am I good? Okay, cool. So um, this is the CGD seminar, Climate and Global Dynamics seminar. Um, I want to thank the OCO two slash three, I think is the proper way to say it, um, participants um, for allowing the joint seminar. Um, so I want to introduce today's speaker, Scott Denning from Colorado State University, who's going to be presenting Cosmos to Carbonate, Contemporary Carbon Cycling, and Comprehensive Chemical Context. Gotta love that alliteration. Um, so Scott's quick biography. He wanted to be an astronomer as a child, but his college had no such major. But following a Grand Canyon summer hike, he decided to become a geologist. When the oil industry collapsed in 1985, Scott spent five years researching the effects of air pollution on the geochemistry of mountain snowpack and surface waters in Rocky Mountain National Park. In the 1990s, he went to grad school and began learning about Earth's carbon cycle, doing forward and inverse modeling of CO2 and the contemporary carbon cycle. For a long time, he managed big research program and wrote lots of journal articles. Now that he is old, Scott told me I could say that. Scott told me I could say that. He wrote this, actually. Um, <laughs> he stopped writing proposals and annual reports and has returned to teaching and learning. He spends most clear moonless nights imaging the remote cosmos just for fun. Um, and quick reminder for those who are watching remotely, please remember you can ask questions at the end of Scott's talk using Slido. If you're in the Chapman or the director's conference room, there's a QR code and information on a sheet on one of the desks. Um, but if you are watching via YouTube, just go to slido.com, hashtag CGD seminar, and that will take you to our questions page. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Am I on? Yeah, I can on. So um, I think I did a, uh, an OCO talk in this room in 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, but I'm thinking back. And I did th the only other CGD seminar I have ever given um, was on election day of 1994. Uh, the, the day that Newt, the Newt Gingrich Republicans took over Congress for the first time in 40 years it was sort of an in fact, maybe you shouldn't invite me anymore. Um, but but uh, so, so I, I remember it was snowing. I wore a tie. I was a freshly minted PhD. I was very nervous because um, all of these grown-ups in the room might uh, not approve of what I was saying. Uh, and now I'm old, and I just don't care. Um, so I, uh, uh-oh, now that's supposed to work, right? If I hit this forward button, eh, it's not working. OK, I can just use this. The other button, the other forward button. Yeah, that's what I thought too. It's all right. Oh, no, that's not working either. All right, now we got a problem. Oh, the whole computer is like frozen. Well, so while I'm here, <coughs> oh, no, here we go. All right, so here's uh, the, the um, outline of my talk. I know this is a little weird. It is certainly off the track of OCO. It is uh, a, a bit off the track of what I have done for uh, low these many years. But I'm going to first talk about cosmic carbon chemistry, um, the origin and composition of dust, the dirt in space, literally dirt in space, and the role of that dust in galactic evolution. Then I'm going to move on to carbon and climate on Earth over deep time, geologic carbon cycling, climate feedback, how the Earth's therm thermostat works, um, and talk very briefly about perturbations to that strong negative feedback, which have led to climate and evolutionary catastrophes over uh, geologic time, dozens of times. Uh, the carbon cycle has gone out of whack and caused um, really, really catastrophic consequences. The, the stuff that we're going through now may rank among them, but is not like bigger and badder than, than those other ones. Uh, talk about the contemporary carbon cycle, in particular, uh, the concept of TCRE, transient Car climate response to cumulative emissions, and um, why that might be problematic for us, and, and what the implications of that are for our current understanding, and then finally, uh, returning to the big picture, the long tail of the carbon cycle over geologic time of our current perturbation and where that's going. Um, a long time ago, 
okay? So they call it the Big Bang, but there wasn't any sound, right? This was the beginning of time. Uh, there wasn't anything to make a sound. Um, just this tremendous um, unfolding of everything. Um, and, and these, uh, I forgot to mention this, I, I'm going to show you lots of astro images in the next few minutes. I took all of them. Um, so, so these are all uh, mostly from a mountain cabin in Wyoming at 10,000 feet. Um, I, I, so, some guys my age collect old cars. Um, I spend a lot of money on cameras and, and stuff. Um, it's actually quite a worthy hobby to try to run all that stuff uh, without electricity or the internet um, in a very cold uh, place. Thin air, brain doesn't work very well. Um, these things are dust factories. They're, they're, they're amazing. They're 100 million light years across, sorry, 100,000 light years across, sweeping waves of creation, smush the stuff together so that it um, is a little bit too dense for gravitational instability. It clumps together, it makes stars. The stars, some fraction of them are very big very short-lived, they blow up before the wave even has time to move on. That's what these, these spiral things are. They are not a vortex, they are not winding up. Uh, that's sort of an optical illusion. They're actually propagating through um, with probably shock fronts that are um, developed from the supernovae that, that come within the uh, clusters of new stars. But look at what's behind the wave as it passes through uh, leaves dust in its wake. What the hell is this dust, right? Uh, centuries ago, people noticed that in certain directions, stars were dimmer than they ought to be and also redder than they ought to be. And they attributed the reddening and the dimming to intervening dust, absorbent material that's in the way of the, of the light. Um, but, you know, we've all heard that. And, and yet, as a Geologist, you wonder what, what the hell are they talking about? Dust? How, how did how did they get dusty out there? Is this the stuff like that's under my bed, so, somehow out in in interstellar space? Um, what what is that stuff made of? Um, it's actually uh, incredibly thick out there in the planes of galaxies. When we look at the Milky Way in the summertime um, from a dark site, you see a big black stripe down the middle of the Milky Way. That's the dust. And it's just incredibly uh, profuse out there. Um, remarkably, after hydrogen and helium, I've been told this is too effing bright. And I'm sorry, uh, no, nobody warned me about the fact that there was a 20-foot LCD behind me when I talk here. Um, so as you know, hydrogen and helium are primordial, right? They, ca they came out of the big whoosh. But uh, if you take that out, most of everything else is CO2. Did, did you know this? That, that something like uh, half of the stuff that is left over when stars blow up is oxygen, and a quarter of it is carbon. And you know, the stoichiometry, this is basically CO2. Stardust is mostly CO2. There are traces of other stuff, but, but CO2 is the most abundant stardust in existence. It is the stuff of which the cosmos is formed, except for that primordial hydrogen and helium. Uh, stars make stardust, right? This is kind of what they are. They're little factories that make stardust. Uh, they're not little, they're, they're ginormous. Um, if you think about fusion, you know, you're making uh, helium out of hydrogen. Um, you might remember your high school chemistry and think, well, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, but no. The, the intermediate ones are all unstable. They all wind up blowing apart as quickly as they're made. So carbon is kind of the next stop on the fusion uh, train past helium. Uh, three heliums is a carbon, four heliums is an oxygen. There's actually a resonance between the carbon and the oxygen, so we wind up consuming the carbon to make more oxygen, and that's why there's twice as much oxygen in the universe as there is carbon. Uh, there's also this interesting catalytic cycle between carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So re really, the, the universe is made of chon, right? C-H-O-N. There, there's an amazing amount of chon out there. Uh, not coincidentally, that's what we're made of too, right? C-H-O-N-N, you, you can pretty much make all the biology out of that. 
Um, and biochemistry is derived from, from this stuff. Stardust, uh, it's alive. Um, this is a uh, beautiful nebula up in uh, Cepheus. Cepheus is a fall constellation, king of Ethiopia, you know, according to ancient Greeks. Um, I, I know it's, I probably have to be careful about saying this. Um, you, you know, ancient Ethiopia. Cepheus was like the Rasta king of ancient, uh, ancient Greece. Anyway, this is, this is a big um, star nursery in Cepheus. This star is Mu Cephei, uh, was named by Herschel in the early 1800s, the Garnet Star. Looks, it's got the color of a pumpkin. If you look at it in binoculars, it looks like a freaking pumpkin in the sky. Um, it's also called Arrakis, which is the name of Arrakis, the, the, the planet in Dune. The, 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 so go figure, I don't know, what, small world. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, why isn't that working? I'm having that problem again. Why? What the hell? Okay, Abhishek, is this your computer? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 uh, so what are you doing? You're just hitting next. Okay. Carbon. It's all made of freaking carbon. This is actually a picture of the dust um, in close to the star. Uh, there's enough scattering off the dust that you wind up getting blue for exactly the same physics as we have a blue sky, right? The, the short wavelengths scatter, you know, to wavelength to the minus four, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but as you get farther and farther out from the central star, um, the absorbance dominates over the scattering and you wind up with this black smudge. The, the universe is filthy. It's fecund. It's full of smoke and grease and dirt. It's really not properly dust because it's mostly organic. It's thick. It's nasty. It's, it's tarry. What? Really? Yes, really. Oh, crap. I'm going to have to do this myself every time now, man. All right. What the hell? Oh, no, no. It's all right. There's more of it. There, there, there's more of the dust. Uh, there's more of the dust. The universe is freaking full of dust. This thing is 30 light years across. Look at that. The main component of the image is dirt. And it's not sand. And it's not clay. It's, it's carbon. It's soot. It's smoke. It's the weirdest stuff. What the hell? Who knew, right? When we were in college, they didn't know this stuff. We, we knew there was something out there. But two great big advances since we were all in school, one is giant radio telescopes that can do remote sensing of the, the molecules in these clouds. Uh, it's, it's radio emission from uh, rotational transitions of, of organic molecules. The other big advance since we were in college is that we actually have samples of the stuff. Um, and it's, it's carbonaceous chondrite meteorites that have fallen all over the world. I meant to bring one, and I freaking left it in my kitchen. I'm sorry. I was going to pass it around. Um, but it's very, very interesting stuff. Um, I, I like this. That's like the fish, and here's the shark, and it's going to eat the fish. Um, this is the dust uh, up through the middle of the Milky Way. The plane of the galaxy is just, is just filthy with this stuff. Um, this is the piece I was going to pass around. Um, it actually fell on a February morning in 1969 in northern Mexico. There was a tremendous sonic boom. Everybody thought the you know, village was blown up. They ran out of their houses. Um, in the morning, there were all these black rocks smoking on the ground. They smelled of, of kerosene and organic solvents. They're full of volatile organic chemistry. What the fuck? Up there in the sky. And it came down and it fell. And now... People have taken those pieces to laboratories and done full-blown, you know, 21st century lab bench chemistry on this, and they have identified thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of different organic compounds in this dust. It's amazing. It is not something that we learned in school because it was not known when we were in school. Um, is that really my next slide? Yes. This is partly how this works. So this is kind of a weird concept. It's, it's selective transparency, right? Just like the greenhouse effect, 
is selective transparency, where the, our atmosphere is transparent and visible, but opaque in the infrared. That's why the Earth is habitably warm. Similarly, get this, the, the carbonaceous dust in the galaxy has a reverse greenhouse effect. It is opaque in the visible and the UV, but it is transparent to very long wave IR. This is like a, a refrigerator. It gets very, very cold in the interior of optically thick clouds of carbonaceous dust. In fact, four orders of magnitude of cooling from the plasma that surrounds these molecular clouds that glows in you know, bright colors down into the cores of those black, brown, nasty dirt balls where it's like 20 Kelvin, 30 Kelvin, super freaking cryogenic cold, which allows CO2 and methane and ammonia and all of these small molecule gases that are formed from stardust to glom on to tiny little solid grains of refractory minerals that condense out of plasma and make ice. And that ice can then sit there in the cryogenic cold for billions of years and do fabulous organic chemistry and, and construct almost the entire library of prebiotic chemistry that goes into forming us. Oh my God, I mean really, I, I don't think this stuff was known. You know, I'm checking like with, to make sure I'm not like off track here. Okay, um, here's a diagram of this. You know, there's some sort of dust grain in the center, silicate uh, stuff that can actually um, condense at 4,000 Kelvin from, uh, from plasma. Um, but then there's all this carbon monoxide and methane and ammonia and COS and uh, all kinds of, of small molecule um, carbon compounds that freeze on in the cryogenic cold and then you, you let them sit for a few billion years and believe it or not, you, you get, um, let's see, do I have the list here in the next slide? Yeah, you, you get uh, hundreds to thousands of carbon atoms in chains, in rings, in sheets, you get graphene, you get aliphatic chains, you get, you get sugars, you get lipids, you get um, all of the nucleobases present in DNA and RNA in these uh, in situ in carbonaceous dust in space. Even complete proteins have been found in carbonaceous chondrate minerals. Unbelievable. Every amino acid that is used by biochemistry on Earth has been found in interstellar dust. Uh, amazing. I, I had no idea about this when I was a kid. Um, OK. Oh, uh, now I'm being boring. Here, here's a bunch of citations to prove that I, <laughs> that, that, that I didn't make that up. <clears throat> um, so, so, so how does that have to do with the Earth? The Earth started out, of course, with all this organic stuff. But we're in close to the sun. And the inner solar system basically dried out. It, it, the the um, volatiles boiled off, and we're left with silicate cores here in the inner solar system close to the fire. The outer solar system is, is just rife with organic chemistry and with ice uh, beyond the snow line. But the inner, inner solar system is pretty dry. Uh, and eventually, uh, between stuff falling in, late heavy bombardment, what, whatever, that we, we accumulated enough volatiles that we have a, a, a little thin skin of um, habitability here on our rock, early on, uh, the Earth's atmosphere was a reducing environment, so it was full of the kinds of things that would be poisonous to us, things like uh, ammonia and, and uh, H2S and hydrogen, um, things that, that we would be very unhappy uh, if they were there. But of course, um, life made oxygen and uh, well, distillation. I think I'm going to skip this. Um, minerals, minerals evolve. Minerals change. The, the mineral composition of the Earth has changed dramatically from, from the early Earth uh, when it was being formed until, say, uh, a billion years into the history of the Earth. Lots and lots of changes to the mineral composition of the Earth. Ultimately, the big one, though, was oxygen, right? O free oxygen uh, produced by photosynthesis 
what was like pouring bleach into the oceans. It, it was an incredible, nasty change in the, in the redox chemistry of the planet from a reducing environment to an oxidizing environment. It burned a shit out of everything. Everything must have died that, that wasn't already sort of uh, built to, to deal with oxygen. Um, photosynthesis, I, it's okay for me to, so I, I have a notoriously foul mouth. That was supposed to be in the, in the introduction and I somehow forgot to put that in there. Um, photosynthesis is a fucking miracle, right? Ph photosynthesis is the transformation of inorganic gas into protoplasm. You know, you, you try that, right? Um, if, if you could do that, you wouldn't have to go to work. Uh, but, but, but the uh, creation of, of protoplasm from inorganic gas uh, gives off oxygen, which is a deadly poison, insanely reactive uh, material that attacks organic matter like crazy. Um, and ultimately, that led to a snowball earth probably three times during the, during the um, sort of switch from, uh, redox, from reducing to oxidizing environments. We burned off all the methane. Uh, we, we changed the radiative balance of the atmosphere through the process of oxygenating the world uh, probably about 2 billion years ago, then maybe again about 1.6 billion years ago, then about 0 0.7 billion years ago. At least three of these episodes where the, the ice came all the way down to the equator should have been the end of the world, really, because you, you turn the whole world into an ice ball, you know, um, the ice planet Hoth. And, and the uh, albedo would have been sky high, and there's no hydrologic cycle, and, and that really would have been a bummer to, to be around dur during this time. Uh, skip that one, too. Once that got kind of worked out, we settled into hundreds of millions of years of geologic thermostat where CO2, which is volatile, um, is released when subducting plates start to melt. The volatiles are driven off. CO2 and a whole lot of water vapor comes out at, at uh, mid-ocean ridges, um, is degassed into the atmosphere, raises the CO2, raises the opacity of the atmosphere in the IR, warms the climate, moistens the climate. Uh, the warm, moist air uh, with all this CO2 dissolved in it, um, becomes carbonic acid falling out of, the, out of the sky. That dissolves the rocks, silicate rocks, turn into phytoplankton. Um, don't touch it. Thank you. I almost did. I almost did. No, that's good. I needed that. Anyway, um, CO2 comes out of volcanoes, and it is consumed by chemical weathering, by erosion of mountains. This is the big story. Over hundreds of millions of years, the carbon cycle is almost in balance. We're familiar with the almost in balance thing from the contemporary carbon cycle. But the long-term carbon cycle is, is a balance between CO2 production through volcanism and CO2 uh, elimination or, or uh, removal through chemical weathering and formation of limestone. If one of these things gets out ahead of the other for a, a few million years, the CO2 rises and it warms and gets moist. If it goes the other way, the weathering winds, the CO2 falls, it gets cold, it gets dry. And ultimately, that is the big negative feedback that stabilizes climate over, over billions of years. Uh, when, when the volcanoes get out ahead, it gets wetter, it gets warmer, that increases the rate of chemical weathering, which then draws the CO2 back down, and vice versa. So this is the big thermostat. It takes tens of millions of years uh, for a perturbation to work itself out. Uh, so we have these big swings that go from ice house to greenhouse and back and forth. This is 540 million years, the entire fossil record. And you can see these big swings from hot to cold. Um, glacial periods, we're in one now, but it's been a very, very long time since there was uh, polar ice on Earth um, because of this wonderful thermostat that keeps the Earth copacetic uh, over deep geologic time. Uh, there have been some... Uh, very notable excursions from everything being copacetic. Uh, these are trilobites. Trilobites were like the dominant thing in the oceans um, in the Paleozoic. We, pa Paleozoic means old life. The Paleozoic ended very abruptly 252 million years ago uh, because of a carbon cycle catastrophe. Uh, big, 
igneous province, just blah, 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 lots of magma boiling out of the, out of the earth uh, in what is now Siberia, came up through a huge thick sequence of limestone, vaporized the limestone. There was also a bunch of organic matter in that, made massive amounts of CO2, probably tenfold increase in the CO2 um, over millions of years. Um, that wound up leading to sort of a cascading series of environmental crises that killed more than 90% of all species on Earth at the time. Absolutely un unbelievable catastrophe. Set evolution back, um, took 25 million years for life to recover from, from this incredible catastrophe at the end of Paleozoic, end of old life. That led to the dinosaurs, essentially, for the Mesozoic. Um, there have been lots of these, but that was the big one, the 252 million years called the Great Dying. Let, let's not do that again. Um, <laughs> The PETM, a much more recent one, 56 million years ago, much less severe than the Great Dying. Um, still argue about what the heck caused the PETM. Maybe it was methane clathrates uh, coming out of solution. Um, roughly a five-fold increase in CO2, roughly a 10C warming, massive ocean acidification. Maybe 70% of species were killed in the PETM. Uh, not 90 plus percent like the Great Dying, but it took 250,000 years uh, for the CO2 to recover. So we, we actually have some pretty good analogs for what happens when you quintuple CO2 and then watch what happens uh, over time. No need to pay too much attention, but this is the P PETM, and here's a whole bunch of other ones like it. Each one of these little downward spikes in the, in the Del C13 um, indicates a hyperthermal. So these are, these are sudden carbon cycle catastrophes dozens of times in the geologic record. Again, one of these things that we didn't know about when we were in college, uh, the carbon cycle can go bad. The carbon cycle can turn around and, and eat your lunch, um, perhaps with, without any human help. In fact, for sure, without any human help. All right, uh, you, you guys know this part, uh, contemporary carbon cycle. Um, just. I think it's kind of interesting. One seventh of all the CO2 in the atmosphere is destroyed every year. One seventh of all the CO2 in the atmosphere is destroyed every year through photosynthesis. So, you know, only have to wait seven years, it's the end of the world. Uh, well, wait, no. Because obviously, one seventh of all the CO2 in the atmosphere is created every year through microbial decomposition. So, so there's a very, very close balance between. Photosynthesis and decomposition in the contemporary carbon cycle, which is quite analogous to the uh, volcanoes and weathering in the, in the geologic carbon cycle. We, we, we've all seen these things before. Um, half the CO2 from fossil fuel goes away. Uh, maybe half of the half that's gone is in the ocean, and half of the half that's gone is in the land. Uh, the ocean part is, is chemistry. The ocean part is primarily carbonation. It's precisely the same chemistry that is responsible for the fact that beer goes good with pizza. Um, it, it's the, it's the it tickles your tongue, it's a little acidic, it cuts through the cheese, it's, it's just great. Um, but, but of course, that's not so good for uh, marine biology. Um, and uh, it, on the land, there's all kinds of things going on. For sure, there's CO2 fertilization, but there's also nitrogen deposition, and there's regrowing forests, and there's boil warming. There's all these things going on. Um, Carbonation, I just mentioned this. Uh, the warmer the water is, the less carbon it can dissolve. And within the observed range of temperatures of the surface ocean, roughly a factor of two in solubility from the tropics to the poles. Um, so uh, as we warm the, the oceans, uh, the amount that you can dissolve into the oceans decreases quite dramatically. It's, it's really not, not a subtle effect. Um, the dissolved CO2, the dissolved anthropogenic CO2, is all at the surface. These are uh, cross sections of the oceans from the surface to the abyss, from the South Pole to the North Pole. I touched it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had... You're going to give me so much No, no, you can just blame it on me. Uh, so, so, so look at how the anthropogenic CO2 is concentrated at the top. It's because the water floats, right? The, the surface water is buoyant. Um, it's very, very difficult to get the anthropogenic CO2 down into the body of the ocean. Uh, yes, there's a vast amount of water down there that could potentially host uh, anthropogenic CO2, but that water has not touched the surface of the ocean, that is the atmosphere, since the time of William the Conqueror. 
uh, the deep ocean doesn't know we're here yet. The deep ocean is, is, um, is still pre-industrial. We're conducting the giant planetary titration. We're going to react the uh, anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere over the next uh, several millennia with the deep ocean. Uh, but ultimately, what we really need to worry about is sinks that run over. Uh, the land sinks are extremely vulnerable. Uh, and actually, their future is, is, is uncertain, right? The, the land sinks, uh, you know, CO2 fertilization, I, I call this the Girl Scout cookies theory of biomass, right? When there are Girl Scout cookies in my cabinet, my biomass increases. Um, <laughs> and it, it's a, a, a pretty reliable thing. Um, but as it turns out, the biosphere as a whole needs more than Girl Scout cookies, right? It's just, junk food doesn't cut it. Uh, it needs protein. It needs, it needs uh, light and water and all these things. So, so being able to sustain the CO2 fertilization means you also have to dump a bunch of nitrogen. Uh, some nitrogen deposition is good. Um, try this at home. If you have potted plants, you put a little miracle Grow in there, you get you know, nice growth. Put 10 times more miracle Grow in there, and you're not going to get 10 times more growth. Right? There, there, there's a point where uh, the, the nitrogen just pisses out the bottom. Uh, there's an even worse point where the nitrogen is, is essentially poisonous to the plant, and the plant will, will uh, not grow anymore, will, will die. Uh, boreal warming, great way to get shrubs in the tundra uh, if you only have a little boreal warming. But if you have a lot of boreal warming, you then have the tendency to thaw the permafrost and then expose this huge pool of carbon to microbial decomposition, which can actually become a source. So, so not a very safe place to store the anthropogenic perturbation. We'd really rather that it go into the ocean. But the, the problem there is that it's limited by this physical uh, thermal stratification, where the, the surface water uh, becomes saturated, but it's, but it's floating on top, and it can't get the, the anthropogenic CO2 uh, to the basement. And ultimately, it will take many turns of the thermohaline circulation, let, let's say three turns, um, to, get, to get the deep ocean in chemical equilibrium with the atmosphere. So that's like the year 5000 AD. That's really waiting a long time. What's your retirement looking like? Um, so man, maybe I should just do this slowly. Uh, let, let's think about a simple conceptual model where we had a pre-industrial atmosphere that was in equilibrium with plants and with the surface ocean. The plants were in equilibrium with soils. The surface ocean was in equilibrium with the deep ocean. Um, in 1800, we start pumping uh, fossil carbon into the atmosphere. We develop this delta PCO2. We force the gradient, uh, and we're pushing CO2 down into those uh, labile reservoirs, which then communicate with the deeper reservoirs. Um, but someday, we're going to stop. I mean, we, we, we promise we will. Uh, we insist that we will, right? We, we must stop. And when we do, the gradient will reverse. Uh, the CO2 that we have, uh, have supercharged the surface ocean and biosphere with will be not any longer in equilibrium with the atmosphere. And there's a possibility that it might come out and bite us in the butt. Uh, skip some slides. How is... CO, how is, how is 1.5 still alive? Let, let me just tell you what these, these two slides that I skipped say. If you do a standard back of the envelope climate sensitivity calculation and you use three degrees Celsius per doubling of CO2, then in order to limit warming to one and a half Celsius, the CO2 has to be limited to 396 ppm. Crap. Um, <laughs> It, because we're well, well over that. So how, how do we still go around to COP27 and say, keep 1.5 alive? The reason that we can still say that is that we believe in the persistence of carbon sinks. That, that's really the only way that 1.5 is still alive is if the sinks persist. The, the modern sinks continue to draw down CO2 um, for decades beyond the end of the, of the emissions. And that is supported by the entire community of Earth system models. So this is, this is I'm sorry, a little bit kind of, you probably know about this. Transient climate response to cumulative emissions, TCRE. What this says is that the um, sensitivity of temperature is not to CO2, 
that's a little weird. We're normally, we, we've taught our students for decades that uh, climate warms in proportion to the log of the CO2, but that's not what this says. This says, no, it warms in proportion to the total historical emissions. E is all of the emissions of carbon from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to today. Measured in gigatons. Uh, that's equal to the change, I'm not touching it, the, the change in temperature with respect to carbon, the part that we, that we know from before, right? This is three degrees per doubling, times the sensitivity of CO2 with respect to emissions. And you can see how the, the algebra works out there. What's a astonishing is that virtually all Earth system models behave this way. That is, they, they warm up the same amount for an emission from 2,000 to 2,001 gigatons of carbon, total historic, as they did from 500 to 501 uh, gigatons of carbon. Really? Do you, do you understand what I just said? This is, this is really rather surprising and, and not what we used to say. And it is, it requires fortuitous cancellation of a whole bunch of complicated nonlinear terms, okay? I, I, this probably should have been a whole talk, but I, I'm gonna just very briefly say this. Uh, the non-CO2 emissions, what, what about methane, right? What about N2O? This should be steeper because of, of non-CO2 emissions, right? It shouldn't just be proportional to fossil fuel emissions. What about radiative saturation? What about the logarithmic response of, of uh, radiation to CO2, right? Beer's law. What, what about uh, changes in the nature of the sinks and carbon cycle under warmer, drier conditions? What about fire? I mean, my God, there's all of this complicated stuff that we spend our whole careers trying to understand, and then modelers tell us, no, 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 it all just cancels out. So you're telling me, this is actually me when I was two, um, that we can predict future carbon sinks under falling emissions so precisely that we can say they will exactly cancel out changes in clouds, changes in the oceans, changes in plant growth, changes in nutrient cycling, changes in fire and permafrost. Oh my God, really? Well, yeah. So, so. I have to admit that I am personally skeptical about this result, and I also, this is an important part of this, I have to admit that our peers, the best and the brightest biogeochemists who work on Earth system models around the world have written this down as their consensus result in AR5 and AR6. This is really what we as a community are saying to the world that this cancellation is real and that we can sort of bank on this linear approximation in the future. So as skeptical as I may personally be, far be it from me to say that everybody is wrong about this. We, we have to respect the process, right? The, the IPCC process. Uh, the implications are rather shocking of this, of this thing. Every kilogram of carbon ever burned in all of history warms the climate by exactly the same amount. A lump of coal in Shanghai in 2022 is exactly equally as bad as a gallon or a lump of coal in, in Ohio in you know, 1974 or in Manchester in 1874. They're, they're all the same. Every kilogram uh, does the same thing. When emissions stop, warming will stop because it's linear. The, the total cumulative emissions stop going up, and so does the temperature. This is actually mathematically required by TCRE. Get, good. No. Okay. Yeah, see? Warming is essentially permanent. 
because the total cumulative emissions is the total cumulative emissions. And the amount of warming that you get from you know, 3,000 petagrams of carbon is the warming you get from 3,000 petagrams of carbon. The only way to make the warming go away is negative emissions, according to TCRE. And because of the slope, negative emissions are guaranteed to only be 50% effective. If I suck down a gigaton of CO2, only half a gigaton goes away because only a half a gigaton shows up when we burn a gigaton of CO2. This is a really remarkable implications of the thing which we say is the consensus result of our whole field. Does it make you uncomfortable? I'm not surprised. <laughs> All right, let me return to the big movie again. This is warming since the depths of the last ice age. Something like three or four degrees warming, maybe four, call it four and a half, uh, from deglaciation through now. Um, and then a very, very sudden warming starting 100 years ago. Uh, that, unless we take very strong action, will be as much warming as the last one, right? The last great global warming was about four or five degrees Celsius. Um, now, notice the slope. This is four or five degrees Celsius over 100 centuries. 0 0.05 C per century of, of warming persisting for hundreds of centuries, for dozens of centuries. Um, the real bummer about, about these higher RCPs or SSPs is that the, the temperature is basically, the warming is basically permanent, right? This is, this is TCRE, it's another uh, example of TCRE. The warming doesn't go away, unless we really limit the warming. You know, you are here, that's the year 3000, that is, you know, seven degrees above pre-industrial in the year 3000, oh my God. That's much more than deglaciation, but 50 times as fast. It, it's just, Stunning how, how big of a perturbation and how fast of a perturbation is. Uh, it's, it's certainly a faster perturbation than the um, Paleocene Eocene um, warming. Um, and it's, it's essentially a permanent feature on timescales of, uh, of interest to historians. Um, the CO2 uh, does start to decline, but it's declining very, very, very slowly. And the reason is that, uh, now this, this is a cartoon graph but it goes out to the year 40,000 AD. You don't see very many of those. Um, so, so this uh, shows the f airborne fraction of the total fossil fuel emissions ever created um, as a function of time. You know, you are here in the year 2000-ish. Um, something like 55% of all the fossil fuel emissions uh, ever burned are in the atmosphere. Um, then we stop. Right? We have to. We, we really have to stop uh, any day now. And then the, uh, the perturbation winds up mixing with the deep ocean over a period of thousands of years. It takes millennia. Uh, you know, think back to King Cepheus of, of uh, Ethiopia. That, that's the kind of time scale we're talking about to um, react the CO2 with the deep ocean. Once it reaches chemical, uh, saturation in the deep ocean, then it has to interact with calcium carbonate uh, to provide enough alkalinity to continue to, um, to dissolve more CO2. Not good if you build your uh, skeleton or house out of calcium carbonate in the ocean, if you're a, um, a calcareous organism in the ocean. Um, that reaction may take tens of thousands of years to play out, and after that we're left with the long-term geologic processes of chemical weathering as we always have been through geologic time, think 50,000 to 100,000 years, just like the PETM. So this is kind of the prognosis for uh, large carbon cycle perturbations. Um, okay. Do you remember this, uh, this, this TV show? Uh, so, so Aria was a little girl in season one, and um, she encountered this guy from Bravos, her sword master, in Arya's civilization, they had the old gods and the new. And she said, do you believe in the old gods or the new? And he said, there is only one god, the god of death. Kind of a grim fella. 
And what do we say to the God of death? Not today. That's what we say. Not today. We have to stop setting carbon on fire. Not just you and me. You don't have to just ride your bike to work or wear a sweater in the winter. Everybody in the whole world has to stop setting shit on fire. Thank you. Okay. Is this on? Yeah. Is it on? Okay. So I guess it's on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, so we are going to take questions now. Or comments. Comments are Or fun. comments. We could, yeah, comments are good. Um, so yeah, just raise your hand. We'll come around with the microphone. Abhishek has one. Um, and Perfect. then, okay, perfect. There's some Earth system modelers in the room. Awesome. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was fabulous. I, I love the whole journey. Um, the TCRE thing is the thing I want to come down to. Sure. And it's all based on Earth system models which have carbon cycles where we have all the processes that have to be stable enough to spin up and persist, right? So do you think the way we create those representations means that the things you're talking about, like fire, other feedbacks aren't actually as, I guess, vulnerable as they could possibly be so that the model can be stable enough to be used? Oh, it's a great question. And I mean, I, I should turn it right back on you, right? Because I, I don't, what do I think? What is my opinion about this? I, I, I told you it, it bothers me. Um, as somebody who has, has spent literally the best part of my life trying to understand all those feedbacks and the, the biogeochemistry of, uh, of global change, it, it, it offends my, my instincts that it all just collapses down to this line. I, I find it just as astonishing. And yet, I, I told you, I, I respect the process, right? I, I go to CESM workshops. I, I go to uh, workshops in Europe or, or in Japan, and I listen to people who've done the very best job they can on their little part of the model to try to represent permafrost and the temperature response of decomposition and the moisture response of uh, photosynthesis and on and on and on and on. And, and people are doing their honest best and dozens of models collapse to a line. They're not all the same line. That's actually pretty interesting. The slope of, of the TCRE line uh, among 40 different ESMs is different by 30, 40%, but they're all linear. I, I'm just flabbergasted by that. I, I don't know what to tell you. We have a, sh yeah, okay, you, you're, you're running the mic. So you said that uh, when CO2 will uh, stop and stay constant, then the temperature will stay constant in models. Now, that actually does not happen. There are many experiments, especially in ours, um, that when you stop, put CO2 to uh, a constant value... Ah, but that's not what I said. I, I don't think. Then the temperature just goes up. It, it's emissions that have to go to zero, not CO2. So, so, so there's two, two different numerical experiments. One is a constant concentration experiment, and another is a zero emissions experiment. Under zero emissions, if you believe ZECMIP, right, zero emissions uh, commitment model intercomparison project, uh, when emissions go to zero, the CO2 falls for some decades afterwards at just the right rate to compensate the continuing warming of the climate through um, ocean atmosphere heat exchange. Now, to be fair, almost every model in that comparison behaves exactly the way that you, you've started your question, which is that um, if you hold concentration constant, the temperature continues to go up. But if the concentration falls for, let's say, 50 years, uh, the temperature remains almost constant during that 50-year time in many, many models. OK, so I'll correct myself then. It's when the concentrations are set there, then the temperature goes up 
normally 0 0.4, 0 0.5 degrees uh, uh, centigrade. Yeah. So my question then would be, well, you put that plot up, are those lines really, really linear? Are they exactly linear? Because if they're slightly off, then I think there's a room to uh, pull holes in your argument. Uh, oh, okay, so, so thank you. And let me, let me um, you're going to think I'm just trying to be a weasel up here and, 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 and get out of this. It is not my argument. Okay, I, I am actually pretty skeptical of, of that argument, uh, of the TCRE uh, representation of our system models. Um, I, I, however, um, have been hanging out with our system modelers for a long time, pr pretty much my entire adult life. I, I am an our system modeler. And I respect that the transient climate response to cumulative emissions is an excellent approximation to the behavior of these models across a huge range of emission scenarios, from uh, you know, SSP 1, uh, 1.9, all the way up to SSP 5, 8.5, um, to, to very, very high levels of CO2, 1,400, 1,500 ppm, uh, or down to 400 ppm. Um, I, I don't think that anybody who is writing, I mean, there's a rich literature about this now, as very nicely summarized in AR6, right? This is not, I did not make this up. I am, I am reporting to you about a received consensus through the IPCC process that is, is published in the, you know, uh, authoritative documents of our field. And it makes me very uneasy. But I, I don't feel that my uneasiness is a sufficient reason to say, yeah, AR6 is just wrong about this. It makes me queasy. But I, I'm not going to argue with you. I, I feel the same way. Dave. Yeah, so I, I um, have read. I, I think every paper that you can search that has TCRE uh, as a searchable item, and virtually every one of those papers expresses the same unease that you do. In addition, there are a number of papers, particularly by our uh, Austrian and Australian colleagues, that show clues as to why the models behave that way and why it may be at least partially an artifact of the correlation between carbon climate sensitivity and climate sensitivity. So that the fundamental cancellation is actually between the, the beta gamma terms and the alpha term. Yeah. And right that here. may be, Guys. in fact, an artifact of conscious or unconscious tuning of these models. And virtually every one of these papers agrees that if there are discontinuous or major nonlinear feedbacks, as you've shown, are very common in the, in the paleo record, that the, t the linear TCRE breaks down immediately. So I, I think that the literature that you're arguing presents a strong consensus, presents an almost equally strong consensus that this is a fragile consensus. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thank you. I, I think that's great. And I, I mean, many of you are in the room, right? What, what do you think, Dave? Yeah, hey, hey. We haven't stopped working on this because this is okay. Yeah. So that's all. I mean, obviously, you keep working on it. I mean, we, for exactly, you know, I saw the permafrost one up on the, you know, it, it would only hold if that's a small feedback. If it ends up being a big feedback, it wouldn't hold. It's just one example of, of many. So, so, so um, it's interesting that the messaging in the primary chapters in AR6 and even in the uh, technical summary and even in the SPM tend to emphasize this linearity uh, when many of us who work in the field are kind of nervous about this thing. I don't know as much as, as Dave here has read every every paper in the literature, but my guess is it's you know it's the desire to make it policy to 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 make it a simpler policy decisions. I mean, it may not be the best idea, but to sort of make it just like 
this is this is as complicated as we need to really understand it to make decisions about reducing our emissions. So, so, so I get that. And actually, Peter, Peter had a good point, too, that it maybe has to do with all, all, everybody's got good points, of course. I, I'm not disagreeing with any of you guys. The, the, uh, Peter's point, if I, if I get it right, is that um, in order to make the models not run away to you know, some crazy non-Earth behavior, we, we tend to sort of corral our feedbacks uh, in such a way that they, they behave better and that this may be at, at the root of this. Dave, Dave's arguing that it is, uh, Dave S, uh, that, that, it, that it's some sort of... Uh, or Zeb Nichols is arguing. Okay. Cancellation of those terms. Of these terms due to conscious or unconscious tuning. Uh, we, we, you know, um, I'm old enough to remember that um, if you get an estimate of GPP that's not 60 gigatons per year because that's what it said in the Miami model that, that you're, you must be wrong. Uh, I mean, people have these weird biases that drag us as a field for decades uh, in, in a sort of conservative way. And, and now Dave Lawrence is, is saying, uh, well, maybe it's a communications thing that um, in order to kind of dumb this down for ministers of, of the environment or you know, heads of state, we have to sort of linearize things so that they can understand that we have to stop setting shit on fire. All fair. Um, it's, it's weird. We, we ought to, if we feel strongly that this is not the case, let's do a better job in AR7 of explaining the nuances rather than jumping on the TCRE um, concept. I, I knew it was going to get me in trouble saying this in this room. That's what you came here, though, right? That's right. Controversy. Um, okay, so can we... I, can I just make w one point related to what Go Scott just it. said? Yes. So, so most of the TCRE literature, the, the, the concept, the framing, the analysis, it, that literature is not authored by primary Earth system model, modelers or Earth system scientists. Most of that literature is written by people who I would characterize as being in the integrated assessment and policy relevant science game. And I, I, I think that you've done something really important here. This is a really important concept for the people <coughs> who've done the model runs that behave this way to pay a lot more attention to. Because it is correct that the models do this and we need to understand why. And it's interesting to have the IAM community poking around <laughs> trying to figure out why, but they are not the people who understand the mechanisms that folks in this room have raised, Peter and, and Peter and, and David and myself. And it, it, it is crucial that the modelers understand why the models do this and whether we believe it's a real phenomenon. Yeah. Thanks. I think... I think we need more emissions-driven simulations, for one, to explore the uncertainty, because we just basically don't do these simulations very often, was, was one thing is needed a little bit. And the other, I think, is what we're working on here, which I'm not sure if it's going to bear fruit or not, but is you know, these models have a gazillion parameters in them. Sure. And, you know, we, we, uh, we just and, have one realization. And, and, and there are dozens of these models, yeah. and they have different formulations. I mean, they're similar, that, that but it's amazing how many of them behave this way. And they don't just behave this way at the margins. They behave this way across a very large range of emission scenarios. So, so that, since I still have the floor and I still have a mic on, I, I'm going to say <laughs> one, one more thing, uh, which, which is that um, I, I thought about doing a different talk here, uh, which somebody else actually coined the title for me. It, it should be called About Face. Okay, And About Face is a presentation that I did not prepare that says that the way we've tested our models, our whole careers, assumes that, that emissions continue to rise. And we don't really know how this apparently linear behavior uh, works if we shut off emissions. Um, if, if we really put our money where our mouth is and say we're going to cut emissions 50% in a decade and another 50% the next decade, and CO2 is going to fall, um, do you really think your CO2 fertilization code and your nitrogen cycling code and your fire code are all going to behave correctly 
under that scenario that is so far outside of our experience as scientists that no one alive has ever done that experiment in the real world. That, that, that kind of motivates the idea that we need a, an experiment that we should call about face, right? Free air carbon enrichment in, in the negative, where, where we deplete CO2 somehow with, uh, with full ecosystems. I, I don't know how you would even do that. Yeah, D direct air capture, there you go. All right, so. Okay, no, you're good. This is really enjoyable, thank you. Um, so we do have an online question real quick. Okay. Um, so here, I put my computer here, but I'm gonna read it out. For okay, you audience. read it, you read okay. it. So has there been any movement in understanding the sources of these organic carbon pulses during these hyperthermals? Yeah, so um, m m this is not my, my real field, um, as, as you know. Um, so it's not just organic. Some of them are certainly organic, and some of them are volcanic, and some of them are combinations of, of organic and inorganic. Um, there are, uh, there's a lot of work on the PETM, because it's the best documented, most recent, really big one that we have for 56 million years ago. Um, we know in each case what the carbon isotope uh, composition of the perturbation is. And so we can try to then apportion that into a volcanic piece, uh, an ocean piece, and, and a, you know, a, a biosphere piece, let's call it. Um, I, I, maybe somebody else here who's a real paleo bio geochemist could comment on this, but I think it's still pretty mysterious. I mean, the PETM is widely blamed on sudden release of methane from um, essentially methane ice in shallow ocean sediments that then spikes the temperature very quickly, changes the climate, and then oxidizes to CO2, and then takes 200,000 years to, to come back to chemical equilibrium. But nobody can really say what destabilized the methane clathrate, right? What, why did all of a sudden all of this methane ice uh, Turn, turn into gas. Um, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, are there, yeah, okay. Hi, Scott. It's really interesting to talk. Um, so, I mean, just on this TCRE concept, so all the discussions and results are really uh, re shown by the modeling groups, so the simulated by the models. I wonder, like, from the observation point of view, mm. is there any way to test this? I mean, we have more than 100 years of uh, uh, temperature and uh, in, uh, fossil fuel emission. So the, the trouble with that is that that entire 100 years lives in here. Oh, okay. a and so the, the, um, the range of values is rather small compared to these very large ranges in temperature and, and CO2 emissions that we can model. Um, and I guess, you know, you, you guys who really were bothered by the talk, help me out here. Um, do you think that the current historical data down here in this bottom, you know, teeny fraction of this graph is sufficient to constrain the linearity of this behavior? No. no. I think tipping points are really the most important thing where systems collapse. And I think our models, as you say, are in this position here where we haven't gone through tipping points. Right? Systems are currently sort of in balance. To a certain extent, they're responding to a perturbation, but they're not. I, I, I wonder if it's really true. I mean, there are certainly models in the CMIP-6 ensemble that go through, in the very highest scenarios, something that we might call tipping points, right? right. Uh, losing the Amazon, uh, melting lar or thawing large amounts of permafrost carbon. Um, and yet they still fall in these lines. Right. Well, m maybe we need a tipping point MIP, you know, like, and we could, we could do paleo, and we could also do sort of future projections with it. Oh, okay. And see how the different models respond to different thresholds. And it would be great if we could come up with experiments, for God's sakes, right? Not just models. We, this is OCO2, right? You, you guys are, are measurement people. What, get, get busy. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Scott, I think maybe okay. um, OCO is transitioning to a discussion about future science directions. And so um, that uh, marks the end of the CGD seminar. Thank you again, CGD participants and OCO. <laughs>